Patrick Garvey. I'm an Associate Professor of Plastic Surgery at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. I'll be discussing the study entitled Psychological Impact of Breast Asymmetry on Adolescents, a Prospective Case Control Study. The authors have conducted a prospective study of adolescent females aged 12 to 21 years who have breast asymmetry to determine the psychological impact of breast asymmetry. The authors found that patients with breast asymmetry experience a reduction in their quality of life. Specifically, young women with breast asymmetry experience similar negative psychological consequences as to what is seen in macromastia patients. This is a well thought out study that quantifies the impact of breast asymmetry in a group of young women. With 361 patients prospectively enrolled in this study, a major strength of the paper is the relatively robust sample size. In addition to power, the prospective design of the study helps to limit recall bias, further validating the study con conclusions. However, there were some issues with the methodology of the study design. Perhaps the most important design aspect of this study was to clearly define which patients fit into the category of breast asymmetry because in truth, 100% of women have some degree of breast asymmetry. The authors define asymmetry as patients with at least one cup size difference between their breasts. I would have liked to have seen a cleaner or and clearer, more specific definition of breast asymmetry as there are no standardized cup sizes. The authors provide photographs of mild, moderate, and severe breast asymmetry, but no specific criteria for classification into these three categories is provided. A more precise, objective, and reproducible classification system for breast asymmetry would have likely enhanced the impact of this study's findings. Another area that deserves specific mention is the influence of the severity of the asymmetry, specifically the influence of tuberous breasts, Poland syndrome, and unilateral macromastia. In aggregate, these more pronounced asymmetries accounted for nearly half of the subjects in the breast asymmetry group, with tuberous breasts representing the largest subpopulation of asymmetric breasts in the study. The predominance of tuberous breasts in the study population may have skewed the findings of the study in favor of the author's hypothesis, since tuberous breasts can represent a more significant degree of deformity than simple breast asymmetry. Since the presence of a tuberous breast deformity likely has a greater psychological impact on an adolescent's patient's self-esteem than would a cup size difference in otherwise normally shaped breasts, the authors perform subset analyses comparing the tuberous breast, Poland syndrome, and unilateral macromastia deformities to those patients with asymmetry but no underlying diagnosis. These subset analyses showed no significant differences between the non-defined asymmetry patients and the tuberous breast deformity, Poland syndrome, and unilateral macromastia patients. Based on these additional analyses, the authors conclude that breast asymmetry, regardless of the type or severity, negatively impacts health-related quality of life in adolescents. A final point that deserves discussion is that of controlling for differences in patient characteristics among the control and experimental groups. The only patient characteristics that were evaluated were age and body mass index. I wonder if other factors than age and BMI might have potentially affected the psychological scores for these patients. For example, the asymmetry patients had a significantly higher mean BMI in comparison to the control group. Given that obesity rates have been shown to differ with respect to socioeconomic status, could the observed differences in BMI between the control and asymmetry patients have represented a co-confounder with socioeconomic status? Could differences in socioeconomic status be contributing to the observed differences in psychological scores seen between the control and asymmetry groups? Without controlling for patient characteristics such as socioeconomic status, a critic of this data might argue that the observed differences in these two groups have less to do with patients' breasts and more to do with family support, financial resources, or level of education. The authors acknowledge this limitation of the study, but do recognize that their patient population is relatively homogeneous as they recruited patients from a single, large, urban tertiary care center. So no study is perfect. But despite these potential sources of bias, the findings of this well-powered prospective study cannot be ignored. Future studies can address the specific issues I've raised, but the overall conclusions of this study should be considered valid and important. 
breast asymmetry clearly appears to represent a significant area of psychological distress for adolescent patients. The observed psychological distress that breast asymmetry creates in developing adolescent women should be taken seriously by healthcare providers as early intervention may help avoid permanent psychological consequences for these young women. The authors are to be congratulated for the significant contribution to the medical literature. And this study should provide significant help to understanding the psychological impact of breast asymmetry on adolescent women and better informed plastic surgeons how to optimally treat these young women's real concerns with their breast asymmetry.